And some of the piece of the book of Romans. And we're continuing. But we need to recap some things before we proceed towards chapter 10. There are three things we've looked at in Romans. Okay. Um, that follow each other in a pattern. Of course, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He was justified by faith apart from the law. So the first thing that we began emphasizing in Romans about the fulfillment of the law and how it cannot bring salvation, but is designed to teach us about our need for salvation, is faith. Uh, chapter 4 of Romans in introduces this. For those who are of the law are heirs. Faith is made void. Um, but it's a righteousness that's through faith. In other words, we do not have... Am I recording okay, Tim? We do not have a righteousness of our own. If you trust in a righteousness of your own based on the law, well, since you fail to keep the law perfectly, it doesn't count. It doesn't work. It is only faith in Jesus who did keep it perfectly. So it was faith. The next thing that happens is we get to chapter 8 of Romans. And when we're in chapter 8, we begin looking at the subject of hope. Let's look at Romans 8, 24, please. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Remember, Elspin, hope, Elspin in Greek, hope is future fact. Future fact. It's not I hope as in I wish. It is confidence in a future fact. Hence, faith and hope go hand in hand. We trust in a future fact. So it comes faith hope, but then the third is, of course, love. In chapter 8, let's look at chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 26. For in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Many people believe that this alludes to the gift of tongues, and indeed it may involve or include tongues. But the point of the matter is, in and of our own capacity, our mental capacity, our intellectual capacity, we cannot approach God because God is spirit. We pray with both our mind and our spirit, Paul tells us in Corinthians. Now, we're not going to go into that now. That's more of a subject for Corinthians. But when we engage in prayer, it involves body, it involves the mind, and it involves the spirit, the body, the mind, and the spirit. Let's begin with the body. Prayer goes hand in hand with worship in scripture. And in Greek, the word is proskuto. In Hebrew, hishtakvaya. It's always this idea of bowing, of bowing, of prostrating. And we should not bow the knee to anyone other than to God himself including to a graven image or idol or likeness. So there is a physical act involved in prayer that has to do with, as it were, bowing the head. It's not necessarily the gesture itself. You don't have to kneel down or prostrate or whatever. It's just that prayer does involve a physical participation in it. We say things with our mouth. We vocally say things, uh, possibly. We could pray silently and sub-vocalize it. But it is, uh, engages the body. Prayer engages the body, okay? So Hasidic Jews mystically distort this with Kabbalah. They believe in capturing zoom zooms and davening you'll see orthodox jews going like this when they're praying and things like this and twirling their ear curls well they're trying to physically engage in prayer with god when they're doing it it's just that they have a mystical interpretation of it 
or mystical misinterpretation, okay? But it is physical, okay? Prayer involves a physical act of somehow clinging to God physically, trying to hold on to him. Second, now, this relates to what Jesus said when he rose from the dead and the apostles wanted to grab him, and he said, don't hold on to me. I have not yet ascend ascended to my father. Remember? They wanted to hold on to him physically, okay? But they couldn't do it until he ascended to the Father. Uh, the prayer would be made through Christ to the Father when he's at the right hand of the Father. It was the Holy Spirit who acted vicariously in place of Christ. So you have the body, then you have the mind. Paul says, I'd rather pray a short prayer with my mind than a long prayer with only my spirit, okay? <laughs> uh, in tongues, in the gift of tongues, there is no active engagement of the mind. The mind is circumvented. It just becomes something purely spiritual. Well, when does this come into play? God gives us a tongue to pray that way in a situation that we cannot be cognizant of something. God may want us to pray about something, but we don't know what it is. The Holy Spirit knows. He searches the depths of God. Hence, the tongue becomes the manifestation. So the tongue is the Holy Spirit doing for us something that we are incapable of because we don't have the wherewithal, the means of the understanding. Okay, now it is valid to say that the spirit intercedes and it does or it can include tongues, but we can't say it is only tongues. Be careful of people who say praying in the spirit is tongues as if not praying in tongues is somehow in the flesh or a purely intellectual act or something. That is not true. All prayer will involve body, soul, and spirit. The body, the soul, and the spirit. Contact with the Son is through the body, okay? Contact with Jesus is through the body. Remember Mary Magdalene holding his feet and things like that. One day we shall actually grab Jesus physically when we see his hands. When we see his hands, we're going to grab him physically, okay? Then we pray with the mind, okay? Pray intelligently. And then we pray with the spirit. The spirit intercedes. In and of ourselves, we are inhibited because of our fallen nature. We don't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit must make intercession. That may or may not involve the gift of tongues. It may or may not involve the gift of tongues. But you can see people praying without intercession of the Holy Spirit. For instance, when you see people standing up in a church meeting every Sunday, making long prayers, and sometimes they like to put it into King James English, and yes, Lord, we do thank thee that thou was to say to us, and they go on and on and on. When you see people who will do that consistently in a meeting, okay, be careful. They're praying usually in ignorance, and they're driven somehow by spiritual pride trying to draw attention to themselves. With the exception of the high priestly prayer, Jesus' public prayers were always concise. The high priestly prayer was different. I'll come to that in a moment. The high priestly prayer was somewhat different, but that was an exception for a special reason I'll explain momentarily. Okay. When Jesus prayed in the presence of other people, the prayers were concise. They had brevity. They got to the point they were not long and drawn out. But he would spend long nights alone with the Father, long prayers, 
Long prayers are personal conversation between us and God. In fellowship, in an assembly, in a congregation, prayers are not to be too elongated. We say what we have to say, and that's it. Now, remember, we're saying it to God, but when prayers are articulated in a meeting, okay, other people have to be able to say amen to that prayer because it's a corporate act of prayer. You're not just praying personally. When you see somebody go standing up, giving that kind of a performance, that's what it is. It's a performance. If it's the Holy Spirit interceding, the Holy Spirit is showing that person what to pray on behalf of those present in the meeting. You understand? They are simply a mouthpiece of the corporate body of Christ who is present. The one-to-one -one conversation where you can go on for hours is a situation where it is you and the Lord alone. You and the Lord alone. Now, I'm not against churches who have these things called nights of prayer and half nights of prayer. However, any prayer meeting has to follow the biblical pattern. Short, concise, to the point, say what you want to say. God already knows what you're going to say before you say it. He wants other people to hear it in a joint meeting, but he doesn't want somebody to turn it into a platform or a stage to draw attention to themselves. The Holy Spirit has to be inspiring, motivating that person as to what to say. Now, if it is in a tongue in a meeting, if it is in a tongue in a meeting, there must be another who prays for interpretation. Otherwise, keep the tongue to yourself. What somebody does in their prayer closet or when they're alone with the Lord is nothing we have any biblical mandate to judge. It's between them and the Lord. But if somebody is going to speak in a tongue in a meeting, others have to be able to say amen to it. And for that to happen, it must be understood. So it could either be the rare case, which is usually used in evangelistic situations, where somebody is saying something in a language they don't speak, but the hearers understand, which is not normally uh, what happens in a plain prayer meeting, like on Pentecost, it was for the unsaved to hear the testimonies of the Lord. Or it has to be interpreted. Be careful of people who go on with tongues every week, every week. Or sometimes you see somebody stands up and they go into a tongue or what they think is a tongue, and somebody stands up and gives an interpretation. Or it's like, and it's the same thing every week. <laughs> be careful when you see that or you see the same kind of prophecies every week and the same people standing up and doing it that becomes a ritual but that is not the holy spirit interceding god does not work that way when it's the holy spirit inspiring the prayer it'll follow the patterns of scripture yes there may be a tongue there may not be the Lord may prompt somebody to say something on behalf of the congregation, and the others may say, Amen. Okay, that is in order. But when you see it becoming some kind of an expectation that this one has to do this, and this one has to interpret it, the tongue and, thing, and sometimes there is no interpretation. It just it becomes almost a fiasco. That becomes a show. When you see that happening, and it's something chaotic, it tells you the Holy Spirit is not interceding in that prayer. Look with me, please. I don't want to delve into 1 Corinthians too much, but look at 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 23, 
If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues and ungifted, and that word ungifted in Greek is interesting, it's idiotai, where we get the word idiot. <laughs> the ungifted men or unbelievers, unsaved people enter. In other words, if non-charismatics or non-Pentecostals or unsaved people come in, will they not say you are mad? They'll think you're crazy. Okay. Now there's much more to it than this. More suited for First Corinthians and for looking at the gifts of the Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit inspires prayer, there will always be characteristics and order. It'll not be something chaotic. It'll not be something that's incomprehensible that people can't understand. If there's a tongue, it'll be properly interpreted. It'll be tested. Remember, a tongue that's interpreted is a kind of prophecy or an equivalent of a prophecy. Okay. Now, again, I don't want to deviate into 1 Corinthians, but it is that. Okay. And you see all these people going on at once. All this. this is not the Holy Spirit interceding. Now, I am not a cessationist. I am a continuationist. I firmly believe in the biblical gift of tongues. I absolutely believe in the biblical gift of tongues. I've seen the real gift of tongues and so forth. But a lot of what is called tongues today is erroneous. It is purely psychological. It is emotional froth. It is automatic speech. It is not something that the scripture actually teaches to be the gift of tongues. Okay. Again, when you look at Corinthians in the background of 1 Corinthians, you understand that at the Delphi, near Corinth was the city of Delphi, where the Delphic Oracle was, and they had this automatic speech. They would say what came into their head when they were inhaling fumes from the uh, sulfur pits. And she would hallucinate and she'd begin singing in these sounds, automatic speech. And then the priests of uh, Delphi would interpret it. And it would be seen as a prophetic revelation of the gods. And these pagan ideas were getting into the church. Well, that has happened today. Things that are just not scriptural are getting in. And people are thinking it's the Holy Spirit interceding for us. It is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does things in order. Okay? He does things that are comprehensible. We don't know what to say. The Lord does. Okay? The next thing that, that we see is the exception of the high priestly prayer. The high priestly prayer is the only recorded prayer in the Gospels we have of Jesus that is not short and to the point. Why? Because it is didactic. It is didactic. What do we mean? Jesus is praying audibly in such a manner as He's using it as a teaching device for the people. He says things like, Father, I know thou always hears me. Thou always hearest me, okay? But I say it for those who are listening. <laughs> it was a didactic prayer. Now, when can we pray didactically? Well, one of the ways we can pray didactically is... When we pray with our children, let our children hear us pray and what we say to the Lord. That is a way to teach them about the truths of God and his word. Children learn from their parents. We audibly let our children and grandchildren hear us pray. That is didactic prayer. Didactic prayer can be longer. Can be longer. But non-didactic prayer in scripture is shorter to the point the long prayers are something you do privately 
between you and the Lord. Okay? Now, again, we don't know how to pray in and of ourselves. It requires the Holy Spirit. You have people doing things and saying things and believing things that are not the Holy Spirit, but they think it is. Again, we have the phenomena of, of so-called charismatic Catholics praying, praying to Mary and things like this at charismatic meetings, and they think it's the Lord, and they think it's charismatic, and they, they pray in tongues to Mary. This is complete nonsense. This is complete nonsense. This is not the Holy Spirit interceding for them. It's not. And people will come out, of course, oh, you're judging, and these people are so sincere. That's a lot of religious garbage. As soon as you hear somebody talking like that, switch them off. They're not worth the time of day. They are not worth paying any attention to. Remember, truth is doctrinal, not relational. As soon as you see people trying to get around what the scripture, what the word of God plainly states by some kind of emotionally charged religious argument, that's somebody who is not worth paying one bit of attention to. Oh, but they're so sincere. How can you judge them? They love the Lord. They're praying to the dead. And you, they're engaging in the sin of necromancy. You've got to look upon their heart. How can you judge? I'm not judging. It's what God's word says. Don't call on the spirits of the dead. How can you not judge? When you hear people give you that religious line of baloney, people like that deserve no respect. They deserve no respect whatsoever. Now, we can love them. We can try to instruct them. But if they're going to continue with their religious babbling, just switch them off. Just switch them off. It's a serious issue. He searches himself and deceives us groanings too deep for words. This strongly alludes to the phenomenon of, of tongues. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Unless the Holy Spirit is interceding for the saints, we cannot communicate with God. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Holy Spirit. And he does this according to the will of God. Well, how do you know the will of God? Well, the first and foremost way we know the will of God is by what's in Scripture. What, he, what he's told us is his will. Seek me not in chaos. Okay. Worship me in spirit and in truth. If the doctrine is wrong, it's not worship. It's religion, but it's not worship. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things do not work for the good. All things work together for the good. Many things are bad. Paul said, I wanted to come to you. Satan hindered us. Look at the book of Job. All things do not happen for good. Satan will put you in prison 10 days. All things do not happen for good. But in his providence, in his sovereign power, in his wisdom, God causes all things to work together for the better. Think of the martyrdom of Stephen. It was terrible. 
It was a tragedy. It was an injustice. Believers were left confused. The Lord got Peter out of prison. Why didn't the Lord rescue Stephen? Stephen was killed. Was that good? No, it was bad. Did God allow it for a purpose? Yes. The church spread, fled and spread, taking the gospel with them. The church began to become introspective, almost stagnated. We're in Jerusalem, people are getting saved, people are getting healed, there's miracles, the churches are growing, the apostles are our pastors, people who knew Jesus are teaching us what he taught them, and what could be better than this? And they forgot about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. The martyrdom of Stephen was a bad thing, but God worked it together with other things for the good. Now, we can't always understand this except in retrospect. We accept it by trust, by faith. In retrospect, we may understand it. At the time, we may not understand it. Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? Why aren't you healing this brother or this sister? Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? Why are you allowing the devil to do this and so forth? In retrospect, we will understand. Ultimately, or we may understand. But what we do understand is, ultimately, God is in control. Think of the book of Job. We were told why those terrible things happened to Job. We were told. But if you read the book, he was not. <laughs> he was not told. Now we assume, well, obviously he knows it now. He understands it now in eternity. But we, we assume he, he may have understood it. But the text does not tell us for sure that he did. It just tells us how God worked it together with other things for the good. But the things themselves were not good. They were bad. The devil was having a, a field day with him. Terrible things. Killing his children, all these things. All things. All things. Do not work for the better. All things work together for the good. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Notice those, plural, the feature of plurality. Keep looking. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. There's two Greek words we have to be very acutely aware of in this particular passage and context. One is proorizo, predestined, and the other is eklento, elect, 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 elect. Now look at it. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Notice Christ is the first among many. Now, firstborn, he was the monogenes, begotten of the father, but not in the biological sense of being the firstborn person. He, he, Jesus was, of course, preexistent. He's firstborn in his position, in his preeminence. Okay? Now, let's look. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Remember, when we're born, we're of Adam. When we're born again, we're of the second Adam, or the last Adam. And whom he predestined. Now, notice these. He also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Notice it's always plural. These, these, these. Okay. 
whom he predestined, he called, and whom he called, these he justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, plural, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not with him freely give us all things? Who will, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died? Yes. Rather, who was raised? Who was at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us? Jesus is interceding for us right now. Notice, we pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Holy Spirit. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Separate us. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake, we, plural, are being put to death all day long. We, plural, were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now notice how that fundamentally goes against the word faith money preachers. It doesn't say that we're not going to face tribulation or distress or persecution or real hardship like famine or nakedness or peril or assault. It doesn't say those things won't happen. God will give us the grace to cope with those things if they do happen. And he will work those things together for the good, ultimately. For sure. But it doesn't say they won't or can't happen to Christians. It just says that these things are never going to be able to separate us from the love of God. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Just as it is written, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. In what things? In tribulation, in distress, in persecution. We conquer in those things. Was Jesus victorious on the cross? Yes. He conquered death. Jesus conquered death on the cross. He conquered the power of sin on the cross. He defeated it by raising from the dead. Had he not died, he could not have been risen from the dead. Had he not paid for our sin, there could be no salvation. All these bad things work together for the good. He goes on. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Now, this is coming from Paul, a guy who gets shipwrecked and arrested and stoned and left for dead. <laughs> I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, antichrist, false prophet, whatever, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, in verse 33, we see the word God's elect. Predestined, foreknew, predestined. He predestined us. Proorizo. He predestined us. He elected us. 
the body of Christ. You want to be among the elect? Be in the body of Christ. That is our election. Our election is corporate. Our predestination is corporate. We must not confuse foreknowledge with predestination. Foreknowledge can apply personally to an individual. Foreknowledge can apply to us personally as individuals. Foreknowledge. Okay. Let's look at an example of foreknowledge. Look with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, that is what we do, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Now look what he says. This is not corporate. But now it has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now look at verse 11. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. And for these reasons, I must suffer this, that, and the other thing to know whom I believed and convince these able to keep that I've been trusted until this day. This is a great Pentecostal worship song. I. He saved us and called us. Paul knew that his role as an apostle to the Gentiles was a calling that God had for him to do from the foundation of the world. Okay. He was not predestined to do it. If he didn't do it, God would have got somebody else. But it was for known. God has something for you to do. He has something for me to do. What we were born again, we got saved. He saved us, but then he called us with a calling from the foundation of the world. From the time time existed, the Lord foreknew we would get saved, but he also ordained or foreknew what he had for us to do. Look with me very briefly, please, to the book of Esther, chapter 4. Verse 14 of Esther 4. Mordecai speaks to Esther. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. Who knows whether you have not attained royalty for a time such as this? Whoa. For a time such as this, God has put you in the situation to do this. That is your calling. It is something that God ordained for you to do from the beginning of time, as we know it. But if you don't do it, Mordecai tells Esther, God will get somebody else to do it. God has something for you to do. He has something for me to do. He didn't just save us to go to heaven. He didn't just save us from going to hell. 
He saved us to do something in this life and in this world that is going to determine both our status in the millennial reign of Christ and our eternal position. In other words, degree of reward. We're saved by Jesus' sacrifice. We're rewarded by how faithful we are to what he called us to do. God foreknew who was going to get saved. But he also foreordained what he had for us to do. That is personal. You're called to do one thing. I'm called to do another thing. He or she are called to do something else. We are called from the beginning of time to do something. That is personal. Fulfilling the calling is personal. For Paul, it was an apostle. That's personal. Calling is personal. Salvation is corporate. Election is corporate. Predestination is corporate. One of the ways we explain it is an insurance annuity. If you pay your premiums, you're insured. I've got to go to the States in a couple of weeks, and I have my travel insurance. If I should take ill when I'm out of Great Britain or something like that, I know I'm insured. Okay. Such it is. As long as you are in the scheme, you are protected. As long as you are in the lifeboat with the life jacket, you will not drown. You're guaranteed to make it. But you must be in. It is not the individuals who are saved. It is the church. <laughs> it's the elect. It's the corporate. To be saved as an individual, you must be part of the body of Christ. Now, this relates to those in part who are out of fellowship. Those who are out of fellowship are in serious danger. They are really in serious danger if they are voluntarily out of fellowship. Uh, and I, I realize it's getting harder and harder to find a good church and people meet in homes and things like that. But those who are chronically out of fellowship... When you see people talking that, I, I don't need church, I just need the Lord. There's people who say rubbish like that. Read Proverbs 18.1. It says, they quarrel against all wisdom. They seek their own desire. You want safety? Get in the boat. You want the assurance? Pay your premium. I don't mean tithe. I mean present yourself as a living sacrifice. Remember, election, predestination are corporate. We benefit from it by being part of the body. We are included in it as members of the body. Somebody is cut off from the body. They're not included. Hine matov umanayim shevet achim gam yachad. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. I'll say it again. Predestination and election are for the body or corporate. Okay. Calling is for the individual. Now, God foreknows everything. In eternity, God foreknows everything. He foreknows. But he doesn't predestine anybody outside of the church, outside of the way of salvation. He predestines the church. He predestines me? No. Predestines you? No. He predestines us. He's elected me? 
No. He's elected you? No. He has elected us. Now, he's called you. He, they were an elect nation. Every Jew was not elect because they were a Jew. They get cut off from their own olive tree. Being a Jew guarantees no one salvation. Being a completed Jew guarantees someone salvation. Coming to faith in the Jewish Messiah guarantees a Jew's salvation. Being part of the faithful remnant of Israel, which today are the Jews who follow the Messiah, Yeshua, well, <laughs> that's election. So when Paul begins talking about the remnant of Israel and the faithful remnant, and he goes back to the time of Elijah and, and so forth, we have to understand the same principles apply to the church. Yes, Israel was an elect nation. Yes, God predestined Israel to be the nation through whom he would give the scriptures and send the Messiah to reconcile fallen man to himself. He predestined, he elected Israel. But did the people who perished in Korok's rebellion, were they elect? <laughs> no, elections corporate. With, 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 with those Jews who murdered their own prophets and wouldn't repent, were, were they elect? <laughs> no, oh, the nations elect, but, but, but they're not. What are we saying? Those Jews who reject their own Messiah, are they elect? The nation remains elect, but not the individual. Do not confuse what Romans says about individuals with what he says about the nation Israel or the church corporately. Predestination, election, speak of the corporate. Okay. Calling speaks to the individual. Let's move on. So we're in Romans now, once again. Let's look at chapter 9. We looked at, again, how the potter and the clay, these things are corporate. It's talking about nations, not individuals, as the Calvinists distorted out of context. Verse 23. And he did, did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, not me, us, whom he also called, not only among Jews, but from among the nations, the Gentiles. And as we looked at, and he says to Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people. So, with this background in view, let's press on now to chapter 10. Remember, you got the faith, and you see the faith again in Romans 9 30. Uh, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. And of course, there's hope, and of course, there's love. Okay. Now, let's begin chapter 10. He begins speaking about the Jews in light of all these things we just reviewed. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. 
I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Be careful of people who confuse a zeal for God with a right relationship with God. Those in a right relationship with God will have a zeal. If someone is in a right relationship with God, they will have a zeal. But a zeal in and of itself does not prove a right relationship. There are some very zealous Jehovah's Witnesses. There are some very zealous Mormons. There are Mormons. There are some very zealous Muslims. And there are certainly very zealous ultra-Orthodox and Hasidic Jews. They're very zealous. No question as to their zeal. But not accordance with knowledge of God's word. Oh, they're so sincere and they're so committed. And they get up in the morning and they go to mass every day. You know, look how come. No, no question as to their zeal. But without knowledge, it means nothing. It's just like worship. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the doctrine is wrong, God does not accept the worship. Pneumocentric worship and other things, praying to the dead. God does not accept that. Oh, but they're so zealous and so fervent. I think perhaps arguably the most zealous and fervent man I ever saw in my life, I saw on a newsreel when I was a little boy in the 1960s. He was a Buddhist monk in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And this was on the news. In order to propound the cause of peace, he poured kerosene over his head, and he lit a match and emulated himself. He was about the most sincere religious man I ever saw in my life. I never saw anybody more sincere or more zealous. And he burned himself alive. An act of worship to a demon. Oh, he was sincere. He thought he was doing something right and noble and self-sacrificial. Those Jews who died at Masada, they thought that they were dying for something that was self-sacrificial, that was right, that pleased them. for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own way, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, in the context, he's talking about Jews. It applies to others, but he's talking about Jews. Remember, Jews are a microcosm of the human condition. God uses the Jewish nation and the Jewish people to teach about the nature of mankind and the fallen nature of mankind. Okay, so there they are. Jesus is the end of the law. That is not a very good translation in fact 
it's a pretty bad translation, even though most Bibles translate it that way. I'm not saying that you can't trust good translations. I'm simply saying there are certain things in Greek and Hebrew that are not all that easy to translate accurately. The word there for end is tedios, tedios. In other words, Jesus in Hebrew, bimatara, actually, Jesus is the aim, the target, the purpose of the Torah. The Torah is to lead us to Christ. What's at the end of all this Torah of the Pentateuch? All this observance and Levitical sacrifice. What's the end of it? What's the purpose of it? What is the aim of it? Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. It does not mean he's the end of it. It means he's the aim of it. He made it clear in the Sermon on the Mount, not one jot or tittle of the Torah will disappear. Oh, it's finished. Christ is the end of it. It's finished. On the cross, he said it's finished. What was finished on the cross is he kept it perfectly. It pointed to him as the atonement. It doesn't go away. Jesus made it clear in John 5. Don't think I'm going to be the one who accuses you on the day of judgment. It's going to be Moses who accuses you. You're going to be judged by the Torah. If you really believe the Torah, if you really believe Moses, Jesus said, you'd believe me also. If you really believe the Torah, you'd believe I'm the Messiah. On the day of judgment, the prosecuting attorney for unsaved Jews is going to be Moses, not Jesus. According to what Jesus said. The Torah is not going away, not one jot or tittle. They're going to be judged guilty by it. We are all guilty by it. The only difference is we have an atonement. We have somebody, a Messiah, who kept it perfectly and who was able to compensate for the fact with his own sacrifice for us who broke it. He is the teleos, the aim, the target, the purpose. It does not mean he's the end as in the termination. Not one yud or tet, not one jot or tittle will disappear. In Greek, it will be iota and tau. Let's look at this. For Moses writes that a man who practices the righteousness, which is based on the Torah, shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith, there it is again, speaks thus. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring the Messiah down. Don't say that. This refers back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring the Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Yeshua as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. According to Isaiah 28, 16, which Paul quotes. Now, let's understand this. 
Who's going to descend and bring the Messiah up? No, God raised him from the dead. Who's going to ascend and bring the Messiah down? He came down of his own volition. Now understand this, Hasidic Judaism, to this day, this passage applies to them exactly. They believe the Lubavitch ones, the Chabad ones, the main ones, believe Menachem Schneerson was the Messiah and he's going to raise from the dead. They have a vigil around his grave in Queens in New York 24-7. Don't say that. The Hasidic movement is based on the astral projection of its founder, Baal Shem Tov, they don't call it astral projection, but it's a, a Kabbalistic teaching. Baal Shem Tov went up to heaven and he saw the Messiah studying Torah and he asked the Messiah, when are you going to come? And the Messiah told him, according to the beliefs of Hasidic Judaism, when every Jew can do what you do. Hence, they promote this mysticism. It's basically astral projection of going up to bring the Messiah down. The very things Paul is warning about and against here, Hasidic Judaism is based on. If you understand what they teach from the Zohar and from the Kabbalah and from the teachings of, of Rabbi Isaac Luria and from Baal Shem Tov, they actually believe this very stuff that Paul is warning against. You can go up and bring the Messiah down. How did, well, obviously the Holy Spirit showed Paul to write it. God knew it would come to this. Now, if you know anything about Jews, Orthodox Jews, you'll see that even in places like Los Angeles, but you'll certainly see it in New York and in Antwerp and in Stamford Hill in London and in, in Israel and Meir Sharim and B'nai Brak, you'll see the poster. We want Mashiach now. We want Messiah now. We want Messiah now. And they think they can make him come by Kabbalah, by, Kab by mystical Judaism, by occult practice. Okay? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to do this very thing. Now, Peter tells believers, we can make him return faster. We can hasten his coming. <laughs> Notice how Hasidic Judaism counterfeits what Peter tells Jewish, and Peter was written to Jewish believers that we can make him come. Jesus said, We will not finish evangelizing Israel. We will not finish going to all the towns and cities of Israel until he comes. Peter says, We can hasten his coming. Notice the New Testament says, We can make him come back faster. But the devil has a counterfeit of this based on Kabbalah and based on the occult. The very things that Paul is warning about here in this particular passage of Romans 10, Hasidic Jews believe to this day, particularly the Lubavitch, but they all believed that you can go up to heaven and bring the Messiah down. If you can get up there through the Kabbalistic practices. It is unbelievable. Oh. The word is in you, in your mouth, in your heart. It's the word of faith. Now look at verse 9. It's dangerous. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. The Bible does not have a lot of formulas. It has a lot of principles. False teachers, particularly in the word faith camp, promote formulas. Yes, if you so an offering of $10,000 by faith to my ministry. God will bring it back to you tenfold. There's the formula to get to get $100,000. Give me formula. Okay. 
You just confess it in the name of Jesus. How they take that out of all context. It's a formula. They like formulas. Roman Catholicism has formulas. If you, if you die wearing scapulas, you, you, you're guaranteed Mary's going to get you off the hook. You know? <laughs> Everybody likes formulas. All false religions, cults, they all like formulas. Mormonism has all these rituals and stuff in their temple, temple rituals. Everybody likes a formula. Scripture is big on principles. Not formulas. However, in this one case, I don't know if I would call it a formula. However, it says if somebody truly believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, if you truly believe it and confess it, you can get saved that way. Now, this can be very dangerous if it is misused. If it is used unto salvation and evangelism and preaching the gospel, it is a very good thing. But there is a spiritual dynamic to be found in believing with the heart and confessing with the mouth. There is a spiritual dynamic in it. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. The resurrection of Jesus, you'll be saved. For with the heart, a man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. If there is a formula in the New Testament, that's it. If there is a formula, I would stop short of calling it that. But if there is a formula, that's it. But you got to really believe in your heart. You got to know it's true and believe it. And you have to profess it. Confess it to God. Confess it before other people. Confess it before the world, before the church. Confess it before Satan. You believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth, resulting in salvation. Whoa. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. We have something very serious and very dangerous in the body of Christ. And it's been around for a couple of generations, certainly. If you really believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus rose from the dead to give eternal life after atoning for our sin, and you confess it, you can be born again. If it's really in your heart and you confess it, you can be born again. If somebody believes something is in their heart and they confess it, and it's not true, It's dangerous. Think of a Muslim suicide bomber wearing a suicide vest. Allahu Akbar! <laughs> Thinks he's going to get 72 virgins or whatever. Hell, believe in his heart. Confess with his mouth. But he didn't get 72 virgins. But he believed in his heart and confessed with his mouth. In so-called deliverance ministry, when you see Christians believing in their heart, they have a demon in them, that they're demonized. And they confess, they say it. I need the liver, I need the spirit cast out of me in the name of they are giving Satan a key to the door. Jesus can come into somebody's heart that way. 
Don't think the devil won't try to get in that way as well if you're stupid enough to give him the key. Remember, no place in scripture is ekbalo, casting out, exorcism, if you want to call it that, ekbalo in Greek. Balo, ek, ballistic, shoot out, throw out. No place is that word ever used with a saved Christian. It's used with unsaved people. It's used with people before they become Christians, but no place with somebody who is born again ever has an ekbalo. Christians can be demon oppressed, but they cannot be demon possessed. If they have the Holy Spirit, a demon cannot enter their spirit. They can be demonically attacked in their mind and in their body. But that term, as we've explained before, is therapeo. People are healed from demonic oppression. You get the word therapy, therapeo. Paul was demon oppressed, wasn't he? Christians can be demonically oppressed, but not possessed. When you see these people confessing that they have demons and that this so-called deliverance stuff, and they begin manifesting, that is a combination of hypnotic induction and demonic deception. It is a combination of hypnotic induction and demonic deception. And it is spiritually and psychologically very dangerous. If you really believe something is true in your heart and you confess it with your mouth that it's true, and you open yourself up for a spiritual entity to enter you. Well, that's fine if it's Jesus. <laughs> that's great if it's Christ. But when you begin, or somebody begins confessing, it, the, oh my. it is a formula for demonic oppression. You are inviting demonic oppression. And you see these people get addicted to it. Who's getting the demon cast out this week? The same one he got it cast out last week. Did our lives ever change or improve? No. Confessing with your mouth what you believe in your heart opens the door. It literally opens the door. Now, if you open the door to Jesus, that's a good thing. <laughs> if you open the door to anybody else, that's a bad thing. They'll come in too. I don't say they'll be able to take <coughs> full possession of a Christian, but they'll certainly be able to oppress them. And get a control of their mind and afflict them in their spirit. What's really frightening is there are churches and preachers who teach this stuff. It is serious, it is not to be taken lightly. But let's look. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Whoever believes, truly believes in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens, no matter how tough life gets, ultimately, 
absolutely assured God's personal guarantee. Anybody who truly believes, truly believes in Jesus Christ will not be disappointed. Co-equally, anyone who trusts or believes in anyone or anything else for their salvation is guaranteed to be disappointed. If we truly believe in him, we have God's personal assurance we will not be disappointed. But if you don't believe in him, you believe in something else, some religion, some cult, some vain philosophy of the world, we also have God's personal guarantee and most certainly will be disappointed. Either way, forever is a long time. That's the reality.